Yes, sir, and I think since you raised from 35 to 2, I was planning to talk about it uh, towards the end. So, <laughs> I think I want to respond to Neeraj uh, as well since he raised the uh, question. So, let me uh, begin with that and then go uh, off the question. I think, uh, as Professor Pandey said, 235 is a very important uh, right, uh, as all of us know. It was not there in the 1898 CRPC, it was introduced in the 1973 uh, CRPC. And I agree that in the Salman Khan case, the fact that I think just a few minutes were given uh, before uh, the next part of the process began indicates the importance or the uh, lack of it that the court showed to uh, the sentencing process and to verify to as if it's just a procedure to be followed rather than uh, the importance that it has in, in the entire uh, criminal trial itself. And I think that reflects the manner in which sentencing has been treated both by courts as well as academia when you say that most textbooks don't have anything on uh, 235 court. But one thing that normally comes up in the context of adjournments and 235 court is the amendment made to 309 uh, in 1978, where a proviso has been put uh, yeah, by Act 45 of 1978 that says provided also that no adjournment shall be granted for the purpose only of enabling the accused person to show cause against the sentence proposed to be imposed on him. And this comes in right after 1973, although the Supreme Court sort of had ignored the existence of that uh, proviso to 309 and repeatedly in cases including the Sudanese and others have said that a pre-sentence hearing is a right and adjournment should be granted. Uh, so, I think 309 itself, the amendment itself, uh, negatives what the law commission had uh, said prior to the 1973 report, uh, in that this is the stage of the process where, as the Supreme Court said in the case of Sakta Singh, evidence can also be brought in by the parties in the question of sentence. Now, if you want evidence to be brought in on the question of sentence, which is hardly done, then you need time because you don't know coming into the court that day whether it's going to be a conviction or a bit. So, if where there is a conviction, then you get time to argue only on issues of sentence. And the problem that ends up happening is instead of arguing on issues of sentence, you argue again back on on merit, saying circumstantial evidence, etc., etc., etc. Or the other thing is for sympathy, uh, where you try and sympathize with it. We uh, try the judge, to try to get the judge to sympathize with the abuse and say, oh, this person is so and so and so and so, which is why you should be. Uh, Sentence. So that, that's the framework which uh, I was going to keep in mind as I go ahead uh, with my presentation on sentencing. Now, what I propose to do is to look at uh, the manner in which courts have talked about how an appropriate sentence has to be decided, uh, to look at the research that is existing on questions on disparity in sentencing and the solutions that uh, various jurisdictions have taken in relation to that disparity and also again to talk more about uh, how we can uh, uh, contribute as academics uh, to research and work on sentencing. Uh, I'll begin again with the Criminal Amendment Act uh, of 2013 and the entire approach to sentencing that was uh, taken there. Uh, I'll actually go one step back and go to the Criminal Amendment Act of 1983. Uh, also made amendments to the rape laws of the person. And uh, if you look at writing during that time, the introduction of the minimum sentence and uh, harsher sentences for rape was introduced with the objective of general deterrence. Uh, you can see the debates around that time, the literature around that time, indicating that that was the objective of the legislation in within general terms which by the minimum sentence uh, was introduced and of course judicial discretion was retained with the <coughs> discretion of the judge to reduce sentence by giving adequate special reasons. Uh, studies thereafter clearly indicated that courts uh, were not giving these the giving reasons which were neither adequate nor special uh, to uh, reduce sentences, although repeatedly the Supreme Court said that uh, from cases like we meet saying to the state of Karnataka versus Krishnapa and others, that you have to be really, uh, sensitive in sentencing, especially in uh, cases of rape. And the term adequate and special is an important 
uh, the urban drug deal. Valid reasons and justifications for four and six sentences, but the same Supreme Court at the same time, in multiple cases, said in the interest of justice or because of young age or a bit of passion, etc., it reduced uh, reduce sentences. Um, after December 16, 2012, again, as all of us know, they were called for harsher punishment uh, for rape. There was a belief that to increase sentences, uh, or bringing a death sentence, like long sentences, that would deter people from committing uh, uh, rape and accordingly. Uh, sentences were increased across the board from 354 up to uh, 376 offenses. Um, so the question is, was this the solution that was required at that time? I mean, there are enough studies done on the expression of adequate expression reasons. So what was the problem uh, with sentencing? So I think that then takes us back to, was there a problem? And to be able to understand whether there was a problem, we need to first define disparity in sentencing. Because without a definition of disparity, we cannot say that the sentences are disparate. And you have from Sad to Ashford, Julian Roberts, and to one version, many more of them who try to make explicitly on sentencing, beginning the entire work of saying that first they might disparity. And they say, and justifiably so, that disparity in sentencing is good. You cannot have everybody getting the same sentence. If everybody gets the same sentence, that is as arbitrary as if everybody getting different sentences, because that means you are not taking factual situations into account. So what is the problem is not warranted disparity, which they say is these are answers, but unwarranted disparity. And unwarranted disparity they define as a circumstance where courts consider reasons which go beyond the stated theory of punishment followed by the ER statute or which has come into guidance to courts. Or use extra legal or extra constitutional reasons in their sentencing process. And so that is unwarranted disparity in sentencing. Now, was there unwarranted uh, disparity in sentencing? In the death penalty context, we have a lot of studies with the Supreme Court in Santosh Kumar Bharia uh, saying that yes, there is a disparity in sentencing. It does sentence, it's not principal sentence. Uh, again, in a couple of other cases, the Supreme Court again articulated uh, uh, that view. I studied uh, rape sentencing in detail. I looked at uh, all judgments given by all high courts to Supreme Court and the court between 1984 and 2009 uh, in a 25 year uh, period to see whether there is disparity of sentencing sentencing and I used uh, regression analysis, statistical analysis uh, to analyze as to whether uh, what were the factors that were impacting sentencing and I found uh, as people have, people have said earlier, that there was a huge impact of rape myths and stereotypes on the sentencing process. So things like past sexual history, the marital status of the victim, the relationship between the, between the abuse and the victim definitely had an impact on sentence. So did uh, acquaintance rape. Uh, injuries were considered a very important factor. So the um, my theory was that because of the manner in which the discretion uh, of courts had been taken away in the guilt adjudication phase of the trial, all the stereotypes that existed in that phase had completely moved into the sentencing phase. And courts were now uh, using uh, sentencing as a place where they excise the discretion, excise the sympathy. When they had doubt, they didn't acquit, but they sort of brought it out in the sentencing process. Something I mentioned in on, uh, uh, earlier when I spoke to you earlier, the second in statutory uh, rape cases, as, as I said, they were giving period undergone uh, because they felt that this was consensual uh, uh, cases and that was not the sentence uh, warranted. Uh, similarly, I found that uh, with Gurmeet Singh and uh, the Prakash Jain, with the court saying court testimony should be taken, any case where courts were, uh, were like convicting based on court testimony, sentence automatically. So you had a situation where the court said, I believe you, but since you are the only witness, let me uh, give a little bit of leeway to the person that was the uh, sentence. So uh, going back to those definitions of disparity, I concluded that yes, there was a moderate disparity uh, in sentencing and we need to do something about it. But the major concern for me uh, reading 
all these around 1000 cases was that there was hardly any reasoning. So, most of the conclu earlier conclusions that I was talking about that derived from statistical analysis of the really difficult asking questions of the individuals. But when even in that process, you have a 20 page judgment, maybe 100 paragraphs, the 100th paragraph is on sentencing. There is nothing else in the judgment that ever talks about anything to do with sentencing. Right? And that was, I think, a major factor uh, which was of concern that courts were not thinking that it was important for them to give reasons why they sentenced someone to five years, seven years, uh, nine years. Right? Even the Salman Khan order, as you read the Salman Khan order, you won't see any reasoning about sentencing. It's gone about on the homicide, not on the murder, not the except, but in sentencing it's just arguments placed by one counsel, arguments placed by other counsel, and on the facts and circumstances, this is the sentence. Right. So if I were the accused, I don't know why I got what I got. Similarly, in taking celebrity cases, Sanjay Dutt, right. why did he get the sentence that he got? It is, uh, it is a situation when people, both the accused might say, oh, I am suffering because I am a celebrity. And the public, because they have given no reasons, say, oh, because he is a celebrity, got away. So the accountability that the uh, judiciary has is something that they have not recognized uh, when it comes to the sentencing process. So, so how should courts determine appropriate sentence? Uh, we had the Law Commission of India in its 47th report give us detailed uh, instructions of how sentence should be uh, uh, should be given. And I just read from that what the Law Commission said: a proper sentence is a composite of many factors, including the nature of the offence, the circumstances extenuating or aggravating of the offence. The prior criminal record, if any, of the offender, the age of the offender, the professional and social record of the offender, the background of the offender with reference to education, mm -hmm. home life, society, and social adjustment, the emotional and mental condition of the offender, the prospect for the rehabilitation of the offender, the possibility of a return of the offender to normal life in the community, the possibility of treatment or training of the offender, the possibility that the sentence may serve as a detriment to crime by this offender or by others. And the present community need, if any, of such a detriment in respect to a particular type of offense involved. Sort of saying both rehabilitation and detriment. And this paragraph in the 47th report of the law commission gets, as you know, cited repeatedly by the Supreme Court, where it says this is what we need to keep in mind while uh, uh, we are giving sentence. So there you see that in uh, in the case of uh, Modi Ram was the state of Madhya Pradesh in 1972. You see that in the entire death penalty jurisprudence starting from uh, from Jagmohan and a lot of these principles then get ingrained uh, in terms of what, how to do a uh, case sentence. And then I think uh, when we look at the entire question of theories of punishment, I think we can neatly divide the Supreme Court's jurisprudence decade by decade as to what was the uh, focus uh, in terms of theory. In the 1970s, you had Justice Krishnayal, so the entire focus was on punishment. Cases like Radhevan Prasad, Sunil Patra, uh, Nikala Vijay Kumar, Charles Sobraj, Ramashwai Chakravarti, Edika Adnan Multiple cases where the Supreme Court says that the purpose of punishment is the punishment. And most of these cases, you have Justice Krishnayal uh, on the bench. You have one or two cases which disagree with it when you are not on the bench saying, oh, no, we don't think that's the uh, purpose, but in multiple cases saying defamation is a purpose. Uh, 80s is a mixed bag, we don't see that much uh, clarity on whether they have moved away, but they still are on defamation. It's the 90s where there is a sudden change, going from reformation to retribution. And I, the articulation uh, begins in my assessment with Dhananjay Chattanooga. Uh, 1994, where the Supreme Court brings in the theory of society's cry for justice uh, and says that the society's cry for justice is an important factor that needs to be kept in mind uh, in sentencing. And subsequently, two, year late, two years later, in the case of Google Chinna Vegetation, the Supreme Court said, and I quote, uh, citing uh, Sir James Stephen, that the criminal law proceeds upon the principle that it's morally right to hate criminals 
and it confirms and justifies that sentiment by inflicting upon criminals punishment which expresses it. So you move, and this is AR 1996, uh, Supreme Court page number 196. AR 96, Supreme Court 196. So you move from reformation to saying it's okay to hate the criminal and you have to give punishments to express society's uh, uh, sort of hate towards the uh, uh, towards the criminal and you see both the and actually and uh, this case uh, laying down the foundation for what happens uh, in the 2000s where with society's cry for justice you bring in what the Supreme Court believes is the theory of property where they say we need to keep proportionality in mind and society's cry for justice and that leads to increase in uh, punishment, especially certain set of offences, uh, be it sexual offences, death sentencing uh, and others. Uh, and as uh, academic working in criminal law, we know that the Supreme Court was not really using the theory of proportionality because if you read Dr. Andrew Waters and how it describes proportionality, it's not what the Supreme Court uh, was doing. It was not doing uh, looking at sets of cases to see whether one was more serious than the other. It was not uh, looking at offences, whether the uh, punishment he was uh, offences were proportional or not. And then slowly, like I said, uh, be it in uh, Bariyar or in the state of Madhya Pradesh versus Babu Nut or state of Punjab versus James Arthur, uh, most of this is Sinaster. He starts talking about reasoning in sentencing and it entire lack of reasoning in sentence. And now in the last few years, they have a complete mixture going more again towards so-called proportionality versus uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with society's uh, prior to justice. So we, the Supreme Court has thoroughly confused everyone as to what uh, the theory of punishment uh, should be or how sentences uh, should be given. What has happened at the policy level? Uh, you had Maniman Committee report which we have put one chapter of sentencing sentence into sentencing guidelines. Um, UK has sentencing guidelines and we do this uh, The Menon Committee subsequently also reiterated the Monument Committee's uh, recommendations and said that we should include sentencing guidelines. But both uh, these committees did not base the conclusions on an evidence-based assessment of whether there is a need for sentencing guidelines. And even if there's a need for sentencing guidelines, is the UK model appropriate in the Indian context? What has UK done? Has U UK has studied the entire sentencing process. You had uh, D.A. Thomas uh, who ex wrote extensively from the 1970s studying every sentencing decision. So that the entire body of his work to rely on before they came up with any sort of solution. We don't have that. And so would it be something that uh, we, can, uh, we can use at all? So what is the sentencing guideline? Uh, two definitions which might be important for even in a discussion of sentencing guidelines. One is the first set of uh, who says a sentencing guideline is a piece of authoritative advice issued to sentencers about how they should go about deciding the sentence system to impose. And then Professor Vasik who says Guidelines are a flexible device to ensure that all sentences take into account similar factors for determining punishment. And importantly, he says, they are not meant to provide a right answer, but only to inform, advise, and guide decision making. So basically, we are talking about uniformity of approach, not uniformity of conclusions. And in, the, in a lot of discussion on sentencing guidelines, that is lost and the process goes towards the community of conclusion rather than the community of approach. Again, if you look at Prof. Ashwat and uh, his uh, work on sentencing, he talks about a theory of equality in sentences of, and equal impact of sentences. Uh, uh, I think two excellent books. One is uh, his continuing the sentencing and actual justice new edition comes out again on that which really adds a lot of material to it. And there's a book called Aggravate, Aggravation and Mitigation in Sentencing by Julian uh, Roberts, a set of essays on uh, aggravating and mitigating uh, circumstances using 
scholars from various parts of the world except Asia uh, and uh, discussing various theoretical dimensions with respect to activation and of interesting. And here, uh, the entire articulation of theories of equal impact and equality of sentencing, if you can, uh, you can see that. So what are the various ways in which we can uh, regulate the entire uh, in what, sorry, what are the ways in which you can have sentencing guideline models? One is uh, the legislative regulation model, where you provide a maximum punishment like you have in the IPC and then leave it to judges. That you have full discretion to sentence uh, within uh, the period of years that is provided by the statute. The second is mandatory sentences, where you absolutely have no discretion and they slowly remove in our great uh, law towards a uh, system of partly of mandatory sentences, so they rarely in this part of the world. Okay. And then there are mandatory minimums, again, uh, 2013 amendments. Now, Professor Ashworth, after having studied mandatory minimums, says that when you have mandatory minimums, courts have a tendency to impose that mandatory minimum. They will not go above it. Uh, Prosecutors in, in, in jurisdictions where prosecutors have the possibility, complete freedom to do charging, will ensure that they charge for offenses which are mandated, because that, that makes the job uh, easier as well. Uh, he says tendency to acquit also increases, because when you have a mandatory minimum, when the judge feels that you have a right to sentence has been taken away, even an iota of doubt will lead to, uh, lead to acquit. Right? And this was the experience studied in South Africa, uh, where there were mandatory life sentences for certain types of rape. And uh, there again, they had the similar adequate and special reasons uh, uh, rationale. And so studies in South Africa show that multiple cases, the most gruesome of, uh, of rape sports were finding some reason or the other, which then sort of created furor because they were commenting on the character of the victim or doing something bad to reduce sentence because they were not finding anything else to, uh, uh, to reduce, uh, reduce sentences. Uh, the second model is a judicial model of uh, guidelines. One is appellate review, which again we have uh, where you rely on appellate courts to correct uh, errors by the you know, courts and in their judgments while correcting that provide uh, provide some sort of guidance to uh, the coordinate courts on the sentence. And also UK followed and Australia followed a system of guideline judgments. Similar sort of uh, balancing uh, type that where you lay down, uh, take a particular crime and say these are the factors that should be kept in mind and these are the factors that should not be kept in mind. And then there is the uh, predominantly US model which then schools started moving to other jurisdictions of having sentencing commissions. You set up a sentencing commission, sentencing commission researches into questions of sentencing and then come up with numerical guidelines. Uh, we had the beginning of why it was that you want first in Minnesota when you had set the sentencing guidelines we used the theory of proportionality. The federal uh, crimes in the US had the federal sentencing guidelines which came in 1984 and can it still continue uh, except that they are not mandatory as so those are the various ways that institutions <coughs> have uh, looked at how to reduce uh, unwarranted disparity in sentencing. Um, so what then are the methods of dealing with discretionary powers? One way is to eliminate discretion, which is what we have done in 2013. <coughs> but discretion definitely has its advantages. You require situations where the judge can, has to look at the, uh, at the offender's characteristics uh, and the reason why the crime was committed, etc. So that is important. Uh, another very interesting theory is in the context of discretion theory itself, where uh, Peter Ozan talks about what is called the hydraulic theory of discretion. The hydraulic theory of discretion is a very interesting and simple concept which says that discretion is like water in a pipe or any fluid in a pipe. If you press the pipe at one point, 
fluid will just move to somewhere else in the pipe. So Ozan says that dispersion is something like that. You cut it somewhere, it will just move somewhere else. Uh, so it, you cannot really uh, control where in the system dispersion will move. This was the experience in the US when they took away judicial discretion in sentencing process, the most powerful person in the system became the prosecutor. The prosecutor ended up determining sentence. The judge ultimately was only doing gatekeeping role in terms of evidence in the trial. Sentencing the judge had to because either it was pre bargain or the prosecutor decided which ingredient of the offense would it be under and predicted the sentence to a few months, right? And so this is a major criticism of removing the sentencing process. Uh, what might happen in India? Do our prosecutors have that much discretion? No. The people who exercise that discretion in India are the police. So you cut away discretion in one part of the system. You are giving more power to the police because then they decide while filing the FIR which limb of the section should you go under and then end up determining the sentence. Right? So if uh, in the context of 376 you decide whether it should be 376, 1, 2 uh, and the moment you put it into one of the, if you put it in 376, two minimum sentence is 10 years, uh, you put it within 354 or 354 uh, B or C like, uh, I'm sorry, 54 B like we decide the other day, you can determine whether the maximum sentence should be 5 years or maximum sentence should be so that is the, uh, the uh, problem that Ozan says happens when you actually uh, eliminate uh, sentencing or any sort of discretion in the system. So what could the solution possibly have been? Uh, one thing that the UK sentencing guidelines have started to be uh, and very usefully is to identify a primary justification, offence to offence, the primary justification of sentencing. So you say, for theft, we believe that say, rehabilitation is the theory that we, we use. Then you construct your sentencing uh, factors accordingly. You designate what they call uh, a, a starting point, typical sentence. You say that this, if there are no aggravating or mitigating circumstances, the general sentence for an offence like this would be say five years. So that is the starting point. The judge has the discretion of going upwards or downwards depending on aggravating or mitigating circumstances or other factors that are available. However, UK guidelines say that the judge has to give reasons why he or she is using X factor or the Y or the Y factor in departing from the typical sentence and also has to give reasons why he or she is giving the typical sentence. Because one thing in terms of decision making that all of us know in our, our daily lives as well, if someone gives us a, a, a peg that says what is the marks that you can give in a paper, the minimum is 50, you will start from 50, right? Or safer still, you will give 50 because there is something uh, someone is telling you. If you say 0 to 100, then you have to put in a little more. Uh, but if someone says the average is 50, you would be happy to give the average, you just put 50 to uh, everyone, right? And that's decision making across the world. Psychologists study that and they say it is called uh, this sort of when movement in decision making, someone gives you a peg, you will just latch on to it. And then you will be safe because then nobody can tell you uh, your decision is bad because you were too liberal or uh, too strict. Similarly, in sentencing, the moment you give a typical sentence, you probably latch on to it. Why the UK Sentencing uh, Commission says that even if you give a typical sentence, you have to say why. Which then brings you an accountability to say you have not just been safe and given that. I found in my study that 80% of cases of rape in trial courts, courts gave seven years. No reason. I asked judges, they said it's a safe thing to do. Program of the program, and I asked them. They said, You know what happens? I give seven years. Honorable High Court will not reverse me. Right? There's nothing there uh, 
if I give lesser sentence, then they might pass lectures, might say things about me which will affect my uh, uh, progression. <coughs> Similarly with the high court. Uh, though, although the high court was the place where sentences actually really got reduced uh, or increased, so my conclusion was that the problem is not with the trial courts, the problem is the high courts. Uh, because it, it is the high court judges who are uh, sort of tampering with the entire uh, sentencing process. Uh, So like I said, 80% in trial courts, high courts come down to 55%, right? Because, and then more uh, so, so, so that's what's happening. So reasoning is still, uh, uh, still very important because that gets you away from this being safe. Uh, uh, then there was an interesting approach followed by Justice Mudlitha uh, in, in the case of uh, State versus Bharat Singh. Uh, it was a case of uh, death, it was a death sentence sentence and uh, he using Bachchan Singh and all other cases said all these cases are talking about is this person capable of being reformed? How does a judge sitting in the high court figure out whether the person is capable of being reformed or not? So let us send a probation officer uh, to, uh, to look at the circumstances and figure out whether uh, person is reformed or, or not. I mean, if you read the judgment after that, yeah. what did she do? Yeah. So after that is very interesting. Right? So what the probation officer did, which is the record in the uh, judgment that he gives, he gives life, he doesn't do the death sentence. Uh, he gives life on the basis of one psychiatrist saying you can't be on reform. But what the probation officer did, went to the jail, sat and observed this man for a day, Right. said this is what he is doing, he has not worked recently, done this and done that. I went to his village, I spoke to the victims and gives a report. Is the probation officer trained to do this? Because Pandey was speaking about section 360 and probation of open Act. How are probation officers appointed? What is the statute under which they are appointed? Probation of Offenders Act, if I am not wrong. It is very difficult to find material on this because hardly an like, was saying hardly anything. Nobody has written about uh, uh, probation and probation officer. So, uh, this probation officer is someone appointed in the probation of the Act to look at young people, to see whether uh, in those situations you can. Uh, you propose probation or not and monitor it. 360 read with pro probation of the act. So, a probation officer, when suddenly the High Court says, go ahead, uh, prepare a report on the basis of previous judgment of the Supreme Court, has no idea. Right? And you can't blame the probation officer for uh, having no guidelines to actually do what she uh, ends up doing. And so, he doesn't say it as much in his final judgment, but he sort of says it's a useless report that he gets back from the probation officer. Although in this April 17 judgment 2014, he had said the man should be also uh, examined by a board of psychiatrists. The board of psychiatrists examines and says that yeah, we cannot say it's beyond reform and on that basis he gives him uh, uh, the life sentence. But the probation officer in other parts of the world is a very important tool that a sentencing judge has when he or she is actually uh, sentencing the accused. Because in most cases, because of the manner in which we have looked at 235-2 as just a procedural requirement to meet, what are defense counsels doing? They are using exactly the same reasons across all their cases. Young man, if the person is below 35 or 40, after 40 old, uh, then family to uh, either if you're older, he, was, he has a family, uh, it's mostly he in a lot of these cases, has a family to uh, take care of. Uh, if it's younger, so it's later. Uh, and then basically socioeconomic factors, poor, or if the person is uh, rich, like Salman Khan or Sanjay Dutt, you say everybody else will suffer if you put this person into uh, uh, prison. So there is no thought going in, into uh, 
what uh, aggravating and mitigating circumstances, especially in non-death cases. In death penalty cases, at least some courts have to mention that in cases where there is no death penalty, hardly any sort of uh, hardly any sort of factors being cited. And uh, uh, what is relevant, what is irrelevant, you know. UK guidelines on the other hand provide a list of irrelevant guidelines. It's not possible to give a list of relevant guidelines. So they say from experience. And any sort of sentencing related work cannot be static, it has to be dynamic, you have to be studying it year after year. So they say based on experience this year, some courts have used these reasons. We don't think they justified, so don't use these reasons any further. So that, therefore you're laying down a standard. I'll conclude by talking about the Israeli sentencing guidelines system. It's very interesting. What Israel did, uh, they, they used a mixture of all these guidelines systems, but they also said, on who does the burden lie when arguing aggravating or mitigating factors? A question that uh, the Supreme Court and the Law Commission had sort of touched upon in 1973 when they spoke about 235. So if I as a prosecutor am going up in the sentencing phase of the trial and saying the aggravating circumstances present, that might lead to a death sentence or a maximum sentence. Should I not prove it beyond reasonable doubt? One. Second, as the defense, if I am arguing mitigating factors, should I not show that this mitigating factor actually exists? Would I not need evidence to show that this person is actually the sole bread earner of the family? What are courts doing now? Courts are relying on good faith on lawyers to argue before them, saying this lawyer will not misguide me. So it is, I know, I know the lawyer, so he or she will not misguide me. So what Israel suggests is having a system where if you cite an aggravating factor, burden lies on the prosecution and you have to prove that you are disabled now because it's actually increasing your sentence, so it is, in terms of liberty, it's further curtailment of liberty. If it's a mitigating circumstance, then the defense has to need evidence to show that the mitigating circumstance exists, and that's of the point, uh, not beyond this point. So, so that system is, is just coming two years back. Uh, we don't know, uh, not, we don't have many studies yet on how it's actually work, but that's interesting because here someone's really gotten into looking at uh, evidence during the sentencing uh, process on and in India when we talk about 235-2 people still insist that 235-2 you cannot take evidence uh, because 235-2 is just something to be done in the afternoon after uh, the conviction is given and we let both parties argue and give the sentence immediately uh, uh, that very evening. So I, I think that more discussion and uh, uh, work on sentencing is essential to ensure, like Professor Nigel Walker said, that if criminal law, I I, I, I to use this quote uh, when, when he was in the presentation of sentencing, he said if criminal law is the uh, Cinderella of jurisprudence, then sentencing is Cinderella's in the different baby. Right? So that is the amount of importance that everyone gives to uh, research or uh, writing or judgment or something. That's not that. Thank you.